page 178. Are you washed in the blood?
Good morning. morning. Wonderful crowd we have this morning. If y'all like me, sure have enjoyed this sunshine the last few days. Been long overdue for it. I'd like to welcome you to God's house this morning. I'd like to welcome you to our church for visiting with us this morning. We want you to feel welcome, feel wanted. Most of all, we want you to feel God's love. And our motto for a long time and still is today is come as you are, but don't leave as you came. Hope something said, seen, or done that will change your life. And uh, before we go to Lord in prayer this morning, we want to remember uh, Dennis Addington's mother, I think, passed away. So let's remember that family in a special way. I also heard something, I told this probably, I don't know, it's been several years ago, maybe in the old church, but this cab driver and the preacher, they died, went on to heaven. And when they got there, uh, St. Peter's waiting on them at the gates, and he asked that cab driver his name, he checked his list, he said, yes, yeah. said, said, you're on here, said, here's you a, a silk robe and a, a white garment, or I mean, a, here's you a gold star and a silk robe. He said, enter into the joys of the Lord. And this preacher walks up, asked him what his name was, and he told him, he said, yeah, you're on here. He said, you, here's you a white star and a cotton robe. That preacher kind of scratched his head. He said, can I ask you something, St. Peter? He said, how come I'm a preacher of the word? Followed you all my life and said, I got a white star and a cotton robe. And the cab driver got a gold star and a silk robe. He said, well, it's like this. He said, while you was preaching, people were sleeping. While he was driving, people was praying. <laughs> I guess it's always good to get a good life going. God wants us to smile. So we're going to go to Lord in prayer now. We'd just like to know if anyone has any special spoken requests. Just let it be known by raising your right hand. We'll ask all would to come gather around. I'll ask Brother Scott if he'd care to lead us.
has a plan Though it's hard to see it now You feel you're walking all alone But he is there no doubt When the storm around you rages And you're tossed to and fro When you're faced with life's decisions Not sure which way to go Stand still and let God move are closing in when the tide is swiftly rising and you wonder where he's been friend there never was a moment that his arms weren't reaching out you can rest assured and be secure god is moving right now stand still and let god this week for some reason and uh, isn't it wonderful how God sometimes can put a song on your heart and boom there it is I, I love that song and it, you did a beautiful job it was that was wonderful it's hard to stand still and let God move sometimes but you know that's what he uh, that's what he wants is for him to be glorified in our lives and for us to um, you know just stop we can just stop and focus on him everything else will fall into place um, we're going to do a new song this morning called Give Me Jesus. Um, we, who were at, who's at the concert Thursday night? Show of hands. Wasn't it wonderful? I know that I got a blessing from it. Um, and this song uh, just uh, came to mind, and I started playing, um, and I, I just really was blessed in playing it and learning it. So um, it's pretty easy. If you don't know it, the words are up here. Um, but please sing along with us.
But this is one you know, but it's so simple. But again, this should be every one of our hearts this morning. If we want, we want God's Spirit to show up here at this place this morning. If we want Him to show up in our in our place in our lives. We've got to ask Him to be the center, and we've got to allow Him to be the center. That should be our focus, Lord. Not just this morning, but every day.
The title of our message is No Fear. Uh, and uh, as we uh, get into the sermon, we're going to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. And we've got several things, that, several props that we'd like to use this morning. In 1987 a movement began out of extreme motocross sports and was the biggest slogan in the 1990s. How many of you know what that slogan is? What? No fear. How many of us have been there and got the t-shirt? No fear. And, but this morning, we're going to look how that, that slogan for over 2,000 years was commanded by God to all those who claim to be his. No fear. And I I just want to make this point today. We either have a life this morning fueled by fear or a life rooted in faith. You either have a life fueled by fear or a life rooted and grounded in faith. It's one or the other. To worry means to have a feeling of distress, to be distressed about something every once in a while. To have anxiety means it grows to become a continued state of uneasiness. To have fear means to have a very unpleasant, distressing emotion caused by the pressure and possibility of danger. And some of you right now, you're you're probably ready to check out because you think, well, I don't have much problems with fear. But I want you to know that anxiety, worry, and fear is a very big deal. If you type it into Google search you'll get 79 million results in less than a second. And then I looked at another a research, uh, American Anxiety uh, Health or something, and it said that 2 out of 8, or 20%, 18 and up, 20% of America's population are diagnosed with a severe disorder of anxiety. Now that would be 2 in every 10 people in this sanctuary would have a diagnosis of having a severe disorder, but that's not counting those of us who's never been diagnosed with the problem of a severe anxiety disorder, but those of us who still struggle with anxiety and struggle with fear. And it's not just me, and it's not just one. It's everyone that's here today, and I'll show you biblically, that we will struggle with fear and anxiety and worry in different times in our life. It's the third largest disorder that is known. And so I want you to know, don't check out in this sermon series because if you're not going through it, you're going to go through it. And God has got something to say to you and I today about it. God's got something to say about it. And for those this morning who know what I'm talking about, I mean, you know what it's like when worry really interrupts your life. You know what it's like when anxiety really begins to change and affect you in ways that you you, you don't like. For those of us this morning who knows what it's like when fear gets a grip on us and fear begins to control us, those who knows what it's like in the midnight hour, maybe your time is 2 or 3 in the morning uh, or or 4 or 5, whatever time, in in the midst of the night when the dark cloud of fear and worry and anxiety, uh, when that darkness, that shadow comes upon us and you're up and you don't know what to do, for those who knows exactly what I'm talking about today, God's got a word for you today. God wants to set you free today. God wants to show shine a light in the midst of that darkness to where we can be liberated forever from fear and anxiety and we can be set free by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's got a word for us. So I'm going to ask you to stand as we read these scriptures. I want you to put these scriptures down. I want you to to have them uh, because you're going to need them. And when anxiety and fear comes upon us, uh, these are the scriptures perhaps that God would lead you to turn to But in Matthew 6 and uh, 25, it says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought. That means no anxiety. 
for your life. What shall ye eat, or what shall ye drink? Nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than the raiment? Well, just consider then, and behold the fowls, the birds of the air. For they don't sow not, they, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father, he feedeth them. Here's a very thought-provoking question. The midnight air crowd. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how the flowers, how they grow, how they don't, they don't toil, they toil not, they don't work, neither do they spin. And yet, look at them for the example, for I say unto you that even Solomon, the king of Israel, in all the glory that he was dressed and clothed in, he was not arrayed like one of these flowers. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is here and tomorrow will be cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? And, and here's another thought-provoking question. O ye of little faith. Do you know there's one thing in the Bible that really angered Christ? Was when he would have to say, ye of little faith. It irritated him. Did they not see what I have done? Have they not seen me raise the dead? Have they not seen me heal the blind eyes? But yet they still ask me how I'll feed the 5,000. Oh, ye of little faith, have you not seen what God has done in your life? But yet we still have anxiety and we still have fear because we don't consider who God is. Oh, ye of little faith. Verse 31, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after these things you do, do the Gentiles seek. Another key point. For your heavenly Father knoweth. Right now, I want us all to say, God knows. You ready? One, two, three. God knows. He knows that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and seek his righteousness. And I promise you that God will supply all these things and all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Let us pray. Father, Lord, I can feel the quietness and the stillness of your spirit. We pray, Lord, at this moment. God, we just ask that we can experience you this morning. I don't want, we don't want this house to be a place where we come to out of obligation or we come to God just to sit in a pew. But this morning, at this moment, in this instance, God, we're asking you right now to let us experience you in a deeper way. And God, in that, we ask that you would speak into our hearts, into a problem, a situation, a tool of the devil that so affects our lives in a great way that we fail to consider. But God, we're asking right now in the power of thy anointing that God, you would speak wonderful words and change our hearts at this moment. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So fear and anxiety, number one, where does it come from? It comes from DNA, personality and brain chemistry. I do believe, I do believe there are some medical treatments and things that doctors can help and for those that have problems I believe God has placed uh, doctors in, 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 with severe anxiety I believe that, that there are some things that medicine and, 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 and doctors can do but it also comes from risk factors and life experiences but the one we're really going to look at this morning is the spiritual side of fear and anxiety and worry and the effect that it will bring upon our life and it's real interesting to know that if you know the context of the scripture that Jesus is preaching, I've got to be careful while I step here for a minute. If you know the context of Matthew and 6, you know that it is the Sermon on the Mount. And we know that in the Sermon on the Mount that several chapters in the Bible are, are assigned to the Sermon on the Mount. And we get these great scriptures like the Beatitude, Blessed are they that mourn, blessed are they that hunger and thirst, blessed are they. And, and, and those are great Sunday school lessons. And we also get the Lord's Prayer out of the Sermon on the Mount. And, it, and Jesus teaches us how we are to pray. And we get the scripture that says, Wide is the gate and narrow is the way. That leads. We get that scripture. We also get the scripture that says, Ye are the light of the world. I mean, some great stuff in the Sermon on the Mount. But it's so interesting to me that in the midst of all those spiritually heavy uh, uh, scriptures that we can teach in Sunday school, right in the middle of it, Jesus takes ten verses in the Bible and he preaches a sermon on fear. You want to know why that is? 
Jesus because Jesus knew it's a thing that we'll struggle with today, a thing they struggle with in his time, and a thing for all humanity that it'll be a problem and a thing that we have to deal with. So don't check out of this message because it's a big thing. And Paul sort of elaborates a little more. Paul says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, Paul says, Everybody in this sanctuary, from those that are the age of accountability, whatever age that is, up to an adult, Paul says, you don't consider it, you don't hardly pay mind to it, but understand there is a very real battle and a very real war that's going on in your life. And there is a very real enemy, and he is out today to steal, kill, and destroy the things of God in your life. And so Paul goes on to say, this is the great struggle that we fight. I'm just going to stop and say, are you fighting that struggle? Are you mindful of it daily? I'm not sometimes. But he says, so let's look at the weapons that's formed against us. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. We're not ignorant of his devices. He says in Ephesians 6, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Now what Paul is talking about is arrows and darts that were made out of bamboo sticks. And they were, they were filled in the Roman times with a combustible material. And so we know the scene that at the, at the beginning of a big, large battle, you would have almost over 500 archers at once. And there would be 500 darts or arrows in flight at one command. And they would all be shooting down upon the enemy. And when they would hit, they would combust into a flame and would consume the object that they hit. See, that's what Paul's saying is happening right now in your life. To your marriage, to your job, to your happiness, to your children. That's what's happening to our teenagers, to our young people. Is It's a scene. There's 500 arrows or more at each moment that Satan has filled them with combustible materials that when they get stuck into your life, they will begin to take a flame. And that flame will take you to a place that will begin to consume your life in the ways of Satan and not the ways of God. It's a very real battle. And then he goes on to say in 2 Timothy 2 and 26, he says, And they that might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken, him, uh, taken by him at his will. A snare is a small animal trap. And so what it's saying is not only what I've seen. I, I mean, I've come to Sunday service and I'm, I'm learning that spiritually there's a bunch of arrows being shot at me. And now, you know, you should be walking along life, not in tune with the word of God, not praying like you should not attending church in a regular basis in the fellowship of the body of Christ. And I can just walk around life and then all of a sudden, caught in a snare by Satan. Young people, I want you to see this. It's not a game. It's not peer pressure. It's real life. And when that trap gets you, all the pain that it causes and all the strength of the jaws that it can consume and hold you in. I want us to know there's a very, very real battle. And, and I don't know the arrows today that are affecting your life. I don't know the snares, whether it's substance abuse, whether it's lust, whether it's, you know, I don't know what it is. But I know that one snare that is after you and I, and I know the combustible material that's in these darts is worry. And when those darts hit and worry takes a flame, it grows to anxiety. And when anxiety leads from day to day, it grows to fear, and fear will begin to consume you, and Satan will begin to have his way in our lives. We're in a very real battle today. And fear and anxiety and worry is a very real tool of the devil. And so what are the fears and anxiety that we face? And, and I did a survey, and I'm going to read some to you. And maybe you're, you're there. I'm afraid of world events and what's going to happen in the world. I'm afraid of the health of my family. I'm afraid that I can't pay bills and provide for my family in this economy. I'm a young person, and I am afraid of the future and the unknown. I'm afraid of losing a child to death. 
I've always been afraid of, I had a fear of not being alive long enough to raise my kids and see them grow. I worry about the rapture happening and some of my family not coming to know God. I worry for me being young and wondering what the future holds, not only for me, but my future children. I worry about the unsaved members and friends of my family. I fear eternity. I fear eternity. I fear not being able to provide for my children. I fear not getting a job. I fear losing my job. I fear losing this. I fear losing that. Fear. Anxiety. Worry. You've got it. I've got it. If we just stand up and see it. 37%, and you really got to get this because we're going to bring the scripture into life. 37% of those responses said, I'm afraid of life, health, finances, provisions. 37% of the survey said, I'm afraid of the unknown, society, children, the future. 26, 26% said, I'm afraid of death. 10% said, I'm afraid of making mistakes. And, you know, I, I would have thought that would be much larger. I'm afraid of making mistakes at work, the decisions I make at work or as a Christian. And only 1% said, I'm afraid of, that my unsaved family members will be saved. So, do we have fear and anxiety and worry? If we do, then we need to understand that it's something that Satan uses in our life. And, and I want to tell you, very heartfelt, how that fear will affect your life. It will weaken our faith and bring us to the point of unbelief. You say, that's not that, this worry that I have, it's not that big deal. Yeah, it is. It'll grow to the point that you come to the point of unbelief. I see the Israelites, I see God had delivered them time and time again, and they're standing and they're looking at the promised land that God had given them. And because the enemy was too large, ten spies came back who reported out of the land and said, they're too big, we cannot defeat them. And two said, we can go in and take the land. And because of unbelief, they defied God, and they said, let us go back to Egypt and become slaves. And because of that unbelief, they were not allowed to enter into the promised land. Don't think that unbelief is not a powerful tool of the devil. And there's many of us here today that you've been shaken in your life. There's fear and anxieties coming in your life. You've lost a job. You've got your pink slip. Finances look bad. The things are happening in the world. And you're starting to worry. And worry's moving anxiety. And it's keeping you up at night. And then fear is going to come. And the next thing you know, you're going to begin questioning God. Questioning where you're at, God. And unbelief will come in. And then Satan will get his foot in the door. And the next thing you know, he's got you out of fellowship with Almighty God. Fear will isolate us. Fear will make us feel like we're trying to tackle this situation alone. And, and, and I think about Peter, I think about uh, the disciples after the passion, after they forsook Christ, where did they go? They went to the upper room and they were there isolated all by themselves on, as Saturday's disciples, living in the midst of fear and hopelessness. And fear today of whatever these things are that you've got in your life, and I've got them, but fear will make you feel like you're tackling it alone. You're doing it alone in the midnight air. You'll feel like you're separated from God, and where's God at? And the next thing you know, the Satan will separate you out of fellowship of the church and of the people of God. Fear will make us ineffective, unproductive. I'm Peter, by fear, Peter denied Jesus three times. And just the same, fear of not being accepted by the young person will, will make them to the point where they won't stand for Christ in situations. And our teenagers who are so on fire for God, the next thing you know, because of fear, they're out in the world and they're uh, hooked on substance abuse and this and that. And we sit back and say, what happened to our young people? Fear will have you not step out and do the ministry God's calling you to do. Fear will have you step out and, and give up on being a deacon or a preacher or a teacher. Fear will have you not stepping out and becoming an active member at Mount Olive Church. It's because of fear and it's used to isolate us today. Fear will have you not stepping out and accepting Jesus Christ. It's a powerful tool. Fear robs us of God's glory in our life because by pride we try to hold on and fix the situation and God then can't move and then when God can move he then can change the circumstance and situation and then he can get the glory. But as long as we have anxiety, fear and worry it's pride that keeps God's glory out of our lives and then number one on the list fear changes us. Romans 8 says for, for we have not been given the spirit of bondage again in the fear 
Fear brings bondage. Fear brings slavery. Fear will change how you respond. Fear will change how you interact with your family members. Fear will change your daily activities and your daily outlook. It'll put you in bondage, a heavy cloud, and it'll cause you to be a person that, that, that you, don't, you didn't really know that you could be. It wasn't that long ago. For weeks, I was bothered by anxiety and fear. And it changed me. Responded in ways that, in certain circumstances, situations, I responded in ways that broke me. That's why I'm preaching this message because I can tell you I struggle with it and you struggle with it and when we allow it to remain, it'll change us and, and I was not proud of, of, of some uh, responses that I made and I had to come to the altar of God and bow and say, God, you know, I'm broken today and it was all underlined by fear and anxiety of things that I was trying to control. I'm telling you, it's not a small thing. Fear and anxiety is a big thing and we face it today. I've been there. My wife can tell you up in the late hours of night. I want to be set free of that. Is anybody with me? I'm tired of struggling in the wee hours of the night. I'm tired of battling these things that I know I can't fix. I'm tired of struggling with that. And today, God, let me experience you. And today, God, you send the power of your spirit and you set all that's willing. You set them free today. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Let's go back to the Word. I love the Word. (laughs) Look at what Jesus says in verse 25. He says, take no thought. Look at this. You remember the top 37% was life, right? Today in 2000, what is it, 13, I think, yeah. 2,000 years before that, what did Jesus say? It's awesome. He said, don't be anxious for your life. Don't be a, have fear over what you will eat or what you will drink. 2,000 years ago, don't tell me the Word of God is outdated. Don't tell me it, don't, it ain't interesting. Don't tell me it can't help me in the trials of my life. It's the living Word of God. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, don't have anxiety and fear over your job, over your health, over your finances. Why? He said, well, consider the fowls of the air. They don't work. That's not saying go out here and quit your job and quit working. That's not what God's saying. He's saying they don't work, but God feeds them. I'm just going to ask, and I'm just going to let God lead me today. I, I, this is different. Who's ever been anxious? We won't just say fear because we say, oh, we're a Christian, we can't fear. You know, that may, you know that's a sin, we're not going to fear. So we're not going to call it fear today because I don't want you, but let's just say anxious. Who's ever been anxious over life, over your job, over provisions? or you know, Who's ever been anxious over that? Be honest. It's real. But he said when you do that, when that comes on you, just look at the birds. They don't do anything. Your heavenly father feeds them. And then he says, are you not much better than they in the image of God created in his image? His masterpiece of all creation? That's you? That's me? Are you not better than they? So why are you worrying? He goes on. Verse 27, I worry about making wrong decisions, wrong choices. Verse 27, which of you can can add a cubit to your stature? In other words, who can make themselves better? Can't do it. He said, think of the lilies of the field. They don't work, but God clothes them. Verse 34, take no thought of what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what this country's going to do. We don't know what that country's going to do. We don't know what's going to come down the road. We don't know what's going to happen. You just don't know. God knows. He says, don't worry about the unknown. Don't worry about the future. Why? Because your heavenly father knows. God's just saying, you know what? We just need to step back from our fear and our anxiety. And we need to be reminded today that God is bigger than any fear that you have. That's what he's saying. Remember, 
God is saying, I want you to remember what I've done in the past, what I'm doing today, what I'll do in the future. Remember what I do to the birds of the field. Just sit back today, experience God, and remember who God is, and know that God is bigger today. God is saying, I want you to get your life, I want you, to, I want you just today in this service to really get your roots back down into me with faith in me, which is to place your complete trust upon something, to, to put your belief in me again, to renew that belief in me, which means to throw my weight upon, to rest upon. So today, I'm just going to rest. And I'm going to trust in this God who's bigger than any of my fears. I'm going to rest upon Him. I'm going to lean upon this God today in that situation and circumstance that's keeping you up at night, in that problem that's bringing anxiety into your life, and it's happening today. It's time in this, in this service at this moment to sit back and rest on God and raise the shield of faith and know today that God is bigger today. Aren't you glad of that? Can we say that together? God is bigger. Ready? God is bigger. Uh, now I want to hear from those who's been up in the midnight hour. Now I want to hear from those who's been afraid that they lose their job. I want to hear from those who's got laid off. I want to hear from those today that, that's really went through struggle and trials. And when you say God is bigger, you say it like you believe it today. And So let's say it again one more time. Ready? God is bigger. Amen? Give God a hand this morning. Aren't you glad of that? Now let's move on. So the first step today, when it comes on you, whenever it is, midnight hour, whenever, you stop and you say, God, you're bigger. That's first. Number two, not only is God bigger, but he is my personal God. He is my God. Now, I know this is a lot of, you know, this is preacher talk, this is Bible talk, but let's really step into this verse. We can read this verse and we can highlight this verse and we can say, oh, that's a good verse. Can we really just step into what it's saying? You got two demands by God here. Number one, fear thou not and be not dismayed. No fear, okay? Then he says, the reason you should not fear, for I am, I am, hold on to that one. I am with thee, number one. I am thy God, number two. I will strengthen thee in the midnight air. Two or three o'clock in the morning, if you'll let me. I will help thee in that circumstance and situation, if you'll let me. And I will uphold thee with my very own hand, if you'll let me. So if you look at that, he gives two demands on you, five I wills and two surely's. Surely, surely means yeah, yeah, surely I will, surely I will. And I love this verse because it means that not only is there a God out there, but that God is my God. And so as I look at this, I begin to see the very first phrase, I am. And I think of the, the, the uh, sermons of Jesus when he came and he said, I am the bread of life. And he said, I am the light of the world. And, and I want you to hang with me. I am the door to the sheepfold. This powerful statement of I am. And then we go on and we know that how the Roman soldiers or how the uh, temple guard came to arrest Jesus. And he said, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. And we know we've talked and we've preached and we've looked at the play of how when he said, I am he, they fell as dead men upon the words of saying, I am. And then we go back to the Old Testament. When Moses had committed murder in Egypt. He went and ran and hid in the backside of the desert. And the Israelites were crying out for 400 some years, God deliver us, God deliver us. And finally God came to Moses. And he said, Moses, you've got to go back to the mightiest army in the land, the mightiest ruler in the, in the world. And you go to him and you say, God said, you let my people go. Can we step into that? Moses was running from the mightiest army in the land because he committed murder. And he thought he was okay hiding on the backside of the desert. Number one, you can't hide from God. If you're here this morning, you're playing hide and seek with God and you think you've got things covered in your life, the Bible says everything is open and naked before the Lord. There's no hiding from God today. Christian, with that secret thing in your life, there's no hiding from God. God knows today and he'll break your heart and he'll convict you. 
Be sure your sin will find you out. That wasn't studied. That was just a little added into the sermon. You can't hide from God. So Moses thought he was hiding from God and, or hiding and God found him and he said, Moses, you go down and look Pharaoh in the eye and you tell him right now that, that though you're a murderer, though they're looking for you and you're standing alone, you tell him and look him in the eye and say, God said, let my people go. Moses said, Lord, <laughs> Woo, I don't know about that one. Lord, I can't speak plain. I can't do this. Finally, he said, Lord, by whose authority am I going to tell him that? He said, you tell him I am that I am sent you down to Egypt. The title of God, the great I am, the God who has always been, the God who is today, and the God who is forever. And he told Moses, he said, I'll walk with you. I'll be right by your side. I'll give you that authority to stand in the face of opposition and say, I am that I am is with me today. I want you to know today that this God is your God and I am that I am. If you put your faith and trust in Him, if you believe Jesus and the message of the cross, it is the great I am who is with you. It is the great I am who is with you. It is the God of yesterday, the God of today, and the God of forever. It is the God of angel armies. It is the God who instructs legions of armies who's looking down upon you right now in the midst of that situation, in the midst of that fear, and He can send legions of angels to encamp round about you. The servant of God looked out, Elisha, and he had a servant, and the armies were all around him to take him, and he had one little servant. And the little servant, he was so worried, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And he said... Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And on the banks round about that enemy army was legions of angels with flaming swords. Don't underestimate God, and he is your God. I'm so glad today that I know the one who goes before me. I'm so glad that I know the one who stands behind. I'm so glad that I know the one who walks beside me. It is the God of angel armies today, and he is on my side. Romans 8. Romans 8 said, For we have not been given the spirit of fear again into bondage, but we've been given the spirit of adoption. We are his sons and daughters, where we in the midnight hour can cry out, Abba, Father. The Bible says, 1 John 4 and 4, it says, For ye are of God, little children, and ye have overcome them. You know, that's shouting ground. Ye are of God, little children, for ye have overcome them. For greater is he that's within you than he that is within the world. Aren't you glad he's your God today? Aren't you glad in Hebrews 13, it tells us, for God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That we may boldly say, I will not fear what man can do unto me. I'm so glad that Jesus said in John, he said, be, he said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for praise God, I have overcome the world today. Number two, recognize your God is a bigger God. That whatever circumstance and situation you're facing in your job, in your life, He's a bigger God. He's bigger. And number two, He is your God. So that brings me to the last point. Let me ask the question. Can you, can you say that He is your God? Can you say today that you really truly know Him in a personal way? Praise God, the access comes by the cross of Calvary. We must accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior to know God. Last point. 1 Peter 5 and 6. And here's where it gets personal. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So number one, we recognize God is bigger. Whatever it is. Number two, we recognize that God is on my side. But then number three, it comes to a personal action. Humble yourself. You see, we inflict our own self with worry, anxiety, and fear. The reason for that is because in pride, the circumstance or situation, we want to try to handle it. And we say, oh, we say we gave it to God, and, and, but pride keeps us holding on to the situation. 
and trying to fix it. And that's the best definition I've ever found of fear. Fear is when you realize that you cannot handle the situation any longer, though you have confidence in your own self. So the reason we have worry a lot of times and the reason we have anxiety a lot of times is because there are situations, whether it be jobs or whatever, what, you know, whatever it is, and, and we want to control it and we want to fix it, but in reality it's out of our control and we don't want to surrender that. Is that me? Is it? Okay. We don't want to surrender that. God says what you have to do. He says it through. He says it through. I'm not in control. You say it through. Really? We already know that. We have that worry in the time. But we're still trying to use the situation. God says it's this morning. If you really want to say it through. Do 
that today. Everybody in the sanctuary, we're going to do that today, every other day. Because God cares about me. You see that? No, we read that verse and we highlight it. Look what it says in the I was afraid, I was afraid, I was afraid, I was afraid to surrender my heart. 
heart and love the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Anybody else in here know what I'm talking about? Look at the power of Jesus. Look at the power of fear to save you. Look at the beautiful.
four weeks on fear. 